morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where it's slim pickings when it comes to movie headlines these days. Why is that? Well, it's really where we are in terms of the movie news landscape. Uh, we're still coming off of Comic-Con, where uh, a number of studios, of course, uh, we're heavily invested in having a huge headline extravaganza for those few days, so they've got no nothing left in the tank right now. Uh, and then, of course, D23 is coming up mid-August, so Disney's trying to, I think, uh, hold a lot of major headlines uh, for that event. Also, we're right on the cusp of the ad season for the holiday films. We haven't quite started yet, but we're going to start in earnest, actually, later this week. Uh, because tomorrow, uh, the first full James Bond trailer for Spectre is going to debut. Uh, and then also we have a new Hunger Games trailer, as many of you have uh, pointed out to me. People are very excited to see that uh, debuting on Friday. So, uh, again, I think that things will start to pick up very shortly. But it was, it was really difficult uh, digging up a, a lineup for, today, for today's episode. But I did it. Uh, now, speaking of Disney... Uh, they, of course, while they're trying to hold all their official announcements for D23, that doesn't mean rumors can't hit the interwebs. Uh, on uh, Movie Minute today, I discussed their uh, another live-action uh, adaptation being Greenlit, The Sword in the Stone. Uh, but then another headline that broke late last night uh, was that Benicio Del Toro, of all people, interestingly enough, is in talks for the villain role in Episode 8, uh, which, where, of course, Rian Johnson of Brick and Looper fame uh, well, semi-fame, uh, will take over uh, the, the this trilogy from J.J. Abrams. I guess J.J. Abrams is like, you know what? I didn't do such a good job with the Star Trek sequel. I'm going to make one and then peace out. And I think that Rian Johnson's a very interesting direction to go, and he's certainly less commercial than J.J. Abrams, uh, but I think that in terms of, you know, fan cred, uh, he'll certainly bring that. You know, he's a little bit almost like hiring an Edgar Wright, uh, onto the film, so we'll see how Disney does with uh, a creative talent in the Star, you know, a quirky niche creative talent in the Star Wars uh, tent when things didn't go so well over in the Marvel tent. Uh, but also speaking of Marvel, Benicio Del Toro, of course, already has a relationship with the Disney studio for, from his role as the collector in Guardians of the Galaxy, who will likely see return, so you know, maybe that's one of the reasons that his name floated around. He wasn't the first person to be approached for this, which we'll get to momentarily. Uh, but, you know, maybe Benicio Del Toro is positioned really for a, a resurgence in his career right now, not because of playing the collector, although it just goes to show that every role you take on can have uh, really great ramifications down the line. You know, Hollywood is a business of connections. Uh, but also, Sicario is coming out. Uh, the Denis Villeneuve film, Fantastic French-Canadian director, uh, did Prisoners, an enemy, uh, not last year, I believe, but the year before. A really talented guy, and of course, he's been tapped to do the new Blade Runner movie. So you are seeing some more uh, niche talent move into big, blo big blockbuster filmmaking, uh, and we'll see how many of them turn out as well as Christopher Nolan did. Uh, but anyway... So I think Sicario, the Emily Blunt film that's coming out, uh, has a lot of buzz. I don't know how well it's going to do at the box office, because Emily Blunt, of course, as we've discussed many times, is not a box office draw, unfortunately, and neither is Denis Villeneuve, or Josh Brolin, or Benicio Del Toro. So it's a really tough sell. But the movie looks spectacular. So that might be helping Benicio Del Toro in these negotiations as well. But I think another big question that comes up here is if they're bringing in another villain for uh, Episode Eight. What's going to happen to Kylo Ren in Episode Seven? Right? Isn't he going to continue to be the villain? You know, it's very, it's very mod, it's a very modern style of film, blockbuster filmmaking to always bring in a new villain. Right? If you look at the original Star Wars movies, it was pretty much the same cast throughout the entire film. Right? Uh, the, throughout the entire trilogy, I mean, different things happened to them, and secondary characters were introduced. But you know, the Emperor and Darth Vader were the, you know, the big bad throughout the trilogy, and the the interactions with them became more complex, more dangerous, the stakes were raised, some interesting information was revealed about Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. If anyone has not seen Star Wars, I don't want to be accused of giving you a spoiler, but uh, by focusing on just a singular cast for three films, they're able to do a really great job 
uh, with that cast. It's similar to, I think, what Peter Jackson accomplished with his Lord of, the Lord, of, Lord of the Films. He is kind of the Lord of the Films when it comes to fantasy, but Lord of the Rings and also uh, his Hobbit trilogy. Same basic cast, and a couple of people would come in a little bit later or leave a little bit early, but still. So I, I, I'm a little bit nervous about bringing in the modern idea of, you know, a new villain every movie, because so far, that doesn't really seem to be working for anybody, right? I mean, one of the great things about the Joker uh, that everyone's so excited about is not only how Jared Leto's interpreting him, but that seeds for the character are sown in other movies. You know, a, re a reference in Batman v Superman, Batman showing up in Suicide Squad. The Joker clearly isn't going anywhere. He is going to be a big bad throughout the DCCU. And I think that's the way to go. So anyway, I'm curious to what you think of Benicio Del Toro as a potential Star Wars villain. Uh, you know, they're saying they expect the three leads to continue on. Uh, Daisy Ridley, John Boyega, and Oscar Isaac. Uh, and so that would, you know, that's a very diverse lineup of leads. And then you have another Latino actor, Oscar Isaac, of course, being the first, joining for the second film. So we'll see if all this diversity also pays off for Star Wars. It's a big gamble, but if they can pull it off, it will do uh, a tremendous, it will, it'll take movie making in terms of casting so far forward that Star Wars will not only be a great franchise, but a responsible franchise. Like Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. But anyway, I said that someone else had been approached first for this, and uh, actually a BTT viewer tweeted me, I couldn't find the tweet this morning, so I can't give the person credit, I apologize, but tweeted me this story and pointed out that Joaquin Phoenix was the first person approached for this villain role in Star Wars Episode Eight, and he turned it down. And this BTT viewer said, so that means that Joaquin Phoenix has now turned down both a Marvel uh, film, you know, of course, uh, the Doctor Strange role, and a Star Wars movie. So Joaquin Phoenix sure uh, feels that he is sitting pretty and doesn't have to worry about co going on to any of these blockbusters. Although if he keeps turning down these roles, one has to wonder how many more meetings he'll get, especially in Disney when they're just gonna put his picture up in the break room and be like, don't call this guy. Now, I think that a great role for Joaquin Phoenix is hopefully out there, and now that a rational man has crashed and burned at the box office and not gotten anywhere near the attention that a Woody Allen film starring Joaquin Phoenix should, perhaps he'll be a little more open to the next blockbuster film uh, that wants to talk to him. So I'm curious to what you think also about Joaquin Phoenix and his career choices as of late. I think he would have made a wonderful Doctor Strange. It's like one of the good things about watching... Um, uh, ooh, Inherent Vice, you're like, man, he's so good. If only he'd been Doctor Strange. This is so disappointing. All right, so anyway, for the second story of the day, I wanted to circle back and pick up a story. You know, I was, I was toying with the idea of covering this Ben Affleck you know, directing a Batman movie confirmation, a standalone episode. But I th the more I thought about it, I was like, man, this movie's so far out. What is there really to discuss, right? I mean, it, w it is official that Ben Affleck is going to direct a Batman film, a solo Batman standalone movie with Jeff Johns from DC writing or co-writing. Um, but it's not going to come out until after Batman v Superman and Justice League. So that's like really far away. And also so much is going to be revealed about his version of Batman in those two movies, it's really hard to speculate as to not only what kind of character or version of Batman he's playing, but where that character will be positioned by the time it's, it's time for a solo movie. Now, what I'm excited about is uh, in this package, I mean, we all knew that Ben Affleck was probably going to direct a, a Batman movie. Uh, it's, you know, I think that directing is actually his strong suit right now, and it's probably one of the reasons they were able to entice him to come on to the project in the first place, you know, playing Batman. So I think that was not a huge surprise, but Jeff Johns' involvement is. And I have to say, I know that Jeff Johns has been involved in, like, for instance, the Green Lantern movie, which did not turn out well, but he's very instrumental in the DC television universe that's being constructed over on the CW, which I know many of you are very pleased with, so I think that's a point in his favor. But then also, he is the writer of the Batman Earth One trades. There's two at this point, and they're really some of the best Batman storytelling I've ever read. If you've not read Batman Earth One Volume 1 and 2, you are missing out. I mean, we're talking about storytelling on the level of, like, the great stories of Batman. Uh, and also just great comics in general, like Watchmen, Why the Last Man. Uh, but also, I guess when you're going to talk about Batman stories, this is on par with, uh, like, what Tim Sale and Jeff Loeb used to do with The Long Halloween Halloween and um, oh what's the other one? Oh, I can't believe I don't remember it the long Halloween and then there um, there was an oh there's there's two really there's two really good ones not hush uh, where um, he teamed up with, with Jeff Loeb, teamed up with Jim Lee. That didn't quite work out, but there are two Tim Sale ones. The first is The Long Halloween, uh, and then the next is one that focuses on the origin of Two-Face, and then there's another one, I think it might be, 
oh, I can't believe on top of my head I don't remember the title, but it focuses on the origin of Robin. They're really spectacular, and it's also must-reading for any comic book fan, and especially if you're a Batman fan. But that's the kind of storytelling, that a quality of storytelling, and depth and sophistication of storytelling that I would like to see show up in the movies. I've said that so far the movies seem to be mirroring the New 52, which I think is certainly a very smart uh, and um, valid way to go, and we'll see how that works out. But I would really, 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 I like my wish list would be to see the more sophisticated storytelling of older DC come to light in the movies. That's kind of like I think what Christopher Nolan did. He kind of was more reminiscent of these standalone, uh, you know, miniseries that I think won over so many fans over the years. Like just like Batman Year One is another example of that. The Dark Knight Returns, Frank Miller's famous Batman series. These are all kind of like in that long line, that long uh, history of fantastic trades, standalone trades for Batman. So anyway, those uh, Batman Earth One and Two are uh, Batman Earth One Volume One and Two are so good, and Jeff Johns does such a great job playing with the Batman mythos. You know, it's tweaked because it's an alternate reality. That I'm very excited to see what he'll bring to the table for Ben Affleck's Batman, and I wouldn't be surprised if he's on this project because of his Batman. Earth One's uh, Earth One Volumes One and Two. They're that strong, and clearly changes are being made to the mythos in the DCCU. And I think that well, David Goyer for a time was very good at coming up with ways to change things up, uh, as I think uh, was Christopher Nolan and Jonathan Nolan who contributed to that as well. I think that it's time to maybe move away from Goyer's storytelling. I really do feel the need to make a clean break from the Nolan films because they're not continuing them. So why would you have any ties to them at all? And form a new team. And I think once you read those two Jeff Johns volumes you'll see that he is an excellent pick for this movie. I mean, what he's done alone with the, myth of, with, the, with the mythos of Arkham is pretty spectacular. And he made some interesting changes to Two-Face, which, you know, if you were just told them straight out, you'd be like, that's ridiculous. But when you see it play out in the book, uh, also what he did with Killer Croc recently, uh, you know, you're just like, that's brilliant. So I'm very excited because of the creative team, but it's just really too early to speculate at all on what the project might be. Now for the third story of the day, uh, Netflix has picked up yet another movie. Now I actually got a couple of press invites to go and see the screening of this, but it conflicted with other things that I had going on, so I couldn't go. But this is a new Saturday Night Live produced movie. Uh, you know, Lauren Michaels has become quite prolific as of late, you know, beyond dominating NBC's late, late night uh, lineup. Uh, not only Saturday Night Live, but of course the two late night shows now are produced by Lauren Michaels and feature his talent, The Tonight Show and, um, you know, Seth Meyers' show afterwards. But now he's uh, really getting him further into film. So Colin Jost, or Joost, who is one of the Weekend Update anchors, wrote a movie. So they filmed the movie and it's called Staten Island Summer. And it's, it takes place at a summer, you know, summer camp uh, and it features largely the SNL cast. Now what's interesting is that, you know, they were looking obviously for a distributor and, you know, they had press screenings for this and it ended up going to Netflix. And Netflix uh, decided they were going to package this with, which I'm sure many of you already, this has already occurred to many of you, Wet Hot American Summer, their upcoming miniseries uh, based on that indie film from a couple of years ago at this point, uh, which is going to air on Netflix as well. You know, it's been a, a big get for them. A lot of attention went to the trailer. has a lot of big talent, uh, big names in it. Because I think wonderfully, uh, you know, this is a David Wayne property, but so many people who got their first big break with this movie came back for the miniseries, which I think is quite commendable. It's got Amy Poehler, Bradley Cooper, Elizabeth Banks, Paul Rudd, a very, very strong cast. I think John Hamm has a cameo in it as well. So uh, people, of course, are excited about that. So Netflix said, hey, let's take the Saturday Night Live Staten Island summer movie, which is kind of the same thing, and make kind of an event out of the programming. So this is actually, though, going to debut the day before Wet Hot American Summer, which if I was Wet Hot American Summer, I'd be majorly upset about that. I'd be like, you're going to, you know, take up everyone's appetite for summer camp humor before my miniseries debuts. Shouldn't this debut like in the middle of my miniseries or at the end of it or at least the same day? But by giving it a, a, head, a one day head start, I think it kind of, you know, I think they're saying, well, this is the appetizer to Wet Hot American Summer, which is the main course. But if the audience is too full to eat anymore, where does that leave Wet Hot American Summer? Which, of course, isn't a movie, but several episodes, which you could binge watch, of course, but, you know, they have, they have more to give you. So I, I want to ask you two questions here. 
First of all, do you think this is a problem for Wet Hot American Summer to have uh, another movie, which is pretty much the exact same thing, uh, premiere the day before on the same service? And then also, what do you think of Netflix's uh, strategy for the product that they're offering, right? Netflix is very aggressive. They have that big Brad Pitt movie they just purchased for an absurd amount of money that nobody, they got it because nobody else would invest that kind of money in this movie. Uh, they have, of course, the Kerry Fukunaga, uh, Idris Elba, Beasts of No Nation movie coming out. They have Adam Sandler films. But do you think, are they, I guess my question for you, is Netflix going for quantity or quality? I mean, you can have both, but it's hard. And I, I at first thought they were going for quality and just lucked out that they had so much quantity of quality. Uh, keep, I feel like this is like a, you know, who's on first uh, section of morning movie news, uh, but with the quantity versus quality. But I think that it, now I'm starting to believe sometimes that, you know, they're going a little bit too much for quantity and they're going to lose some quality in the process. So I think Netflix has to be very careful to protect its brand and they want to make sure that they're not just like throwing up content on the viewer, all right, or the subscriber, being like, do you like this? You don't like that? Okay, how about this? Don't click away. I got this. You like this? How about this? You like this? And instead, you have to be like, look, this is what I've got. I'm a quality programmer. If you don't believe me, if you don't trust me, that's your problem, because the entire world vouches for my credibility as a content provider. And I think for a while they had that with House of Cards, Orange is the New Black, Daredevil, but I think that as they get more and more aggressive, and also shows start to slip between the cracks, like Sense8, Peaky Binders, uh, you know, you start to wonder if everyone's going to start to suffer a little bit as a result. Except for Daredevil, which I think is impervious. The only thing that can hurt Daredevil Season 2 if it's, if it, is if it's not good, which is a genuine concern because they had so many changes behind the scenes creatively. So anyway, that's the third story of the day. And the viewer question comes from last week, and this is frequent BTT viewer and BTT voice contributor Anthony Huntington. And Anthony asked a question on his birthday. So a belated happy birthday to you, Anthony. I hope it was a good one. So Anthony says, question on my birthday. Michael Douglas in an interview with The Hollywood Reporter said that today's American male actors are getting beat out for roles by Australian and British actors because Hollywood focuses more on image than on uh, physicality and the craft of acting. Do you think that this is true or is it more likely that European Australian actors have more appeal globally where more and more box office dollars are coming from. Love your show, and I hope you answer my question. Smiley face. Well, happy to happy to do so. Thank you for the question, Anthony. Uh, and I think there are just, you know, Michael Douglas, I think that, you know, there's definitely a divide in terms of who's getting the roles, but I think he's a little off the mark in every other way possible with this statement. So first off, as to Anthony's theory about uh, more global box office, I think that de the box office is definitely becoming more global, but interestingly, Australia and UK are not huge contributors to the global box office tallies. It's still Mexico, Russia, um, and then of course China, China being China, the, the Asian um, trinity. Uh, China, North, uh, South Korea, not North Korea, China, South Korea, and Japan. That is a gold mine. And so I think hopefully you'll be seeing, you know, I think, you know, we talked about the Great Wall going into Comic-Con, how uh, that's a legendary film coupling Matt Damon with uh, Andy Lau, big, big Chinese talent. That's where I think you're going to start to see more Chinese talent in American films or co-productions between America and China. But I think that British and Australian actors don't particularly, um, they don't have any extra pull across the globe. And in their home markets, there isn't a lot of pull to be had anyway. Uh, now, why? Am, now, I actually think that uh, it's, it's the reverse. I think that it's the divide of where Michael Douglas put these things doesn't fit. So this is how I see it breaking down. I think American actors are all about their image and also their physicality, right? If you want a hot actor, you're probably usually going to go with an American actor, right? You're going to go with a heartthrob like Chris Pratt, Ansel Elgort. Uh, these are American actors that are working their way up and getting, you know, both of them, I'm not saying they're not good actors, but they're not, that's not why they're getting work, right? So uh, uh, Ryan Gosling for a, a period of time also, although I guess he's Canadian technically, but still, I think Ryan Gosling is Canadian. But anyway... That's, what Amer that's where American actors, this, that's where their sweet spot is. Now, that's not to say that Australian and British actors aren't attractive. They certainly are. Look at um, uh, Sam Claflin, you know, Finnick O'Dare. But the reason Australian and British actors get work is because there are better acting schools in uh, the UK and Australia, right? There's just a better pedigree of talent. So for some reason, Hollywood has become convinced that if you want a really good actor, you have to go across the pond or way or across, I guess, the other pond. We'll go backwards. We'll go over the uh, Pacific. Uh, you know, the like, uh, what, I don't really wouldn't say that uh, the Pacific is a pond. But anyway, I'm getting off track. But anyway, so 
uh, people feel that because of you know Heath Ledger and like the you know the British you know the Royal Academy of the Arts and people like Benedict Cumberbatch, where uh, American audiences are like, oh, he's just such a good actor, so good. That's where they feel they can get really good talent. And so there are good acting schools and conservatories here in uh, the United States, but largely you have to go through theater. You know, you go through theater and then you work your way up. But I don't think any, any schools in America are known for producing fantastic actors, right? It's just, it's just not the reputation that any of them have. Not to say they can't get work, but, you know, I don't think they're as heavily courted uh, by agents and talents and, you know, casting directors as the UK and Australian film schools, I mean acting schools. So that's the real divide. Also, they still have soap operas uh, in Australia, for instance, and you get a lot of talent from those soap operas. We used to get a lot of talent from American soap operas, but then they died out. So that's really, you know, that's been a really, that was a great inroad into Hollywood for so many people, and it went away. But for instance, Margot Robbie, who everybody's very interested in right now, comes from the soap world in Australia. And so then she had, you know, a good uh, background to come to America and be like, hey, look, I come from these soap operas. You've liked other actors who've come from these soap operas. And she's, she's easier for Hollywood to feel a little more comfortable with. Because as we all know, Hollywood is very risk averse when it comes not just to stories, but also to talent. All right, so that's my answer to your question, Anthony. I think Michael Douglas is right to talk about, uh, you know, uh, neither side, I guess, getting a fair shake. Uh, but I think that it's really going down to do you want a hot actor or do you want a quality actor? And, you know, those are the two different places to go. But again, I hope you had a wonderful birthday. Thank you so much for your question. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Please write down below today's top three stories and that viewer question. Anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow and any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching.